Hi everyone, welcome to the inaugural podcast for my blog, From the Desk and Shelf. This is Andrew. I am the writer and creator behind the blog. Uh, right now, I have kind of an interesting setup going on here. I have my boom mic stand and my mic. I've got my headphones on. And you probably heard the music in the background as the Signals album from Rush. I decided to make that kind of the, the background of this album. Probably won't be able to hear it too well, but hey, I can hear it and I like Rush. So it's not exactly the most ideal setup. I have a very uh, low quality microphone. You can probably hear the quality of my voice. It's just a off the shelf twenty dollar omnidirectional mic. Not a condenser. No pop filter. Nothing like that. But hey, you gotta start somewhere. This is the first podcast. So I decided to do a podcast because I do enjoy writing and will continue to write articles for the blog. Uh, as you may know, I write on all subjects from religion and movies, and I've touched on cooking a few times and just random observations. But I decided to go into the audio realm with the podcast for one reason, just to expand my horizon, just to kind of branch out into something new, but also because the topic I'm going to talk about today is a very massive one, and I knew I wasn't going to have enough time to write uh, a decent article on it. Plus, I don't think anybody would be very interested in reading an article on today's topic. So, It also plays in a lot to the reason for the delay. Uh, a few weeks back, I published a, uh, a schedule, a new writing schedule, where I was going to try to publish articles every Tuesday and Friday. It started out that was fine. I went through the Fall and Film series, if you read that. Uh, it's a series I did all through October covering various horror movies for the Halloween season. But just as I started to get into the groove of this new writing session or this writing schedule, I wound up getting a new job, which normally wouldn't be too bad. But my previous job was a night job, and my current job, my new job, is an office job. So it was a complete 180 in kind of lifestyles and schedules and time and things like that. So... It's been a little bit to get adjusted to, which has been fine, and uh, I've been also working very heavily on my master's thesis, so it takes up quite a lot of time. But I want to talk about today's topic, and I want to do it the best way I could, so I decided to do a podcast. So today I'm actually going to talk about, for our first one here, Dashiell Hammett's story, The Maltese Falcon. Now, if you're not familiar, uh, Dashiell Hammett was a pulp writer, uh, detective novel writer in the 1920s and I think into the 30s. Uh, Maltese Falcon, along with The Thin Man, are probably his two best-known stories. Uh, Dashiell Hammett stands out as a writer because, as I'll talk about in a second with the book, not only was he an excellent writer, but he wrote detective stories and he knew what he was talking about because he was a former detective himself. And so he had content before writing style, I would say, in that... I don't think, at least from reading The Maltese Falcon, he was so concerned about presenting this kind of polished images, of this polished image of detectives and crime stories in general. Rather, he was very ingrained in how criminal, or how, rather, detectives and private eyes worked at the time. And again, we're talking 1920s, pre-Depression era, kind of uh, seedy side of the world. Uh, San Francisco for the Maltese Falcon. so, But I'll touch briefly on the book, and the main bulk of my discussion, I want to talk about three different films. The, f the, mo the book was adapted into film three different times between 1931 and 1941, which honestly today doesn't sound that crazy. You think about how many reboots are coming out and how many reboots have been released. Uh, if you follow movie news, you probably notice that the Fantastic Four is already casting and I th believe filming a new uh, reboot after the last one came out just what, five or six years ago. So not to mention the Spider-Man reboot and all that. So reboots of stories, it's nothing new for us today. And uh, it's very interesting how all three films based on the Maltese Falcon use the same source material, but actually very differently. That's what I want to talk about today. So the book by Dashiell Hammett, uh, I read it uh, just in time to do this podcast. This is the first time I ever read not only that story, but anything by Dashiell Hammett. And I thought it was a great book. If you've ever read it, it's uh, it moves along at a fairly good clip. It's very dialogue heavy. Uh, the story, just like in the movie, it, it 
it's kind of hard to follow. It's a little difficult to follow. So, but essentially, I'll, I'll lay out the very basics. If, if you've never read it and you're just listening to this podcast to find out more about it, uh, the story follows Sam Spade. He is a private detective in San Francisco, and one day he's visited by this somewhat mysterious woman who is seeking protection, or no, rather seeking to have Sam and his partner follow a man whom she believe has kind of quasi-kidnapped her sister. Uh, from there, spoiler alert, Sam's partner is killed, and the story just kind of take off, takes off from there. It's, it's twists and turns at every chapter, and it comes down to various individuals seeking this statuette of a falcon that's supposed to be made of gold and crusted with jewels and worth a fortune. So as the story unfolds, you, the reader, you start, you follow Sam, you follow Sam Spade, and you start to learn just who's on whose side, where the falcon may be, who wants it and why, who's backstabbing who, and it's it just twists and turns at every every page. And it's a great story to follow. It's a great story to read. Uh, if you if you're not familiar with the story, it would certainly keep you guessing every uh, every step of the way. So it's highly recommended as just a novel. Uh, interesting side note, the novel was initially published as a pulp serial, and then I believe condensed in uh, 1929 is when it, uh, I believe, yeah, 1929 when it appeared in novel form. So that's the novel in a nutshell. The standout aspect from the novel, other than the great dialogue and the twisting story, is the fact that you don't really have these kind of good guys and bad guys. Yeah, you have your protagonist and antagonist, you know. You have the the characters that you root for, the main one being Sam Spade. But the thing is, he's not he's not a good person, really. <laughs> he's he's I mean, he does what he has to do to get the job done and kind of hold up to his detective persona and his detective duty, which is kind of keeping himself separate from everybody around him and getting to the bottom of what's going on, especially when there's crime involved, murders and things like that. But his methods are quite questionable. He does some uh, pretty rotten things, and and uh, I won't spoil the ending in case you haven't read it or seen any of the films yet, and, and you want to after this podcast, but essentially that whole aspect of Sam's personality kind of culminates at the end with a decision he has to make with one of the main female characters. So, great story, great read, but you find yourself almost uh, reluctantly re- uh, cheering this guy on because he is uh he's not a very nice person, but he makes a he makes a hell of a detective to be honest. So, so that's the book. Um if you read any kind of reviews about The Maltese Falcon or listen to anybody talk about it uh, the description and the adjective that comes up all the time is hard-boiled it's a hard-boiled hard-edged detective novel and it's true it's uh, kind of the ugly side of the city it deals with murder and betrayal and everything else so and the nice thing i like about it too is uh, and i'll talk about this with one of the films is san francisco plays a fairly major role in the book um you have very accurate from what I understand descriptions of streets and you find out just what street Sam Spade will go down to get to a certain destination or somewhere else he'll go. And I believe Dashiell Hammett was writing obviously in San Francisco at the time. He had been a detective in Baltimore uh, but he had retired after battling some illness to San Francisco to write this story. So the city itself plays quite a role in the novel and is a character unto itself. So the story was adapted three times between 1931 and 1941. Uh, the first adaptation, 1931, directed by Roy Del Rutt, I believe. Uh, I should have written that down. Roy Del Rutt. Uh, I'm going unscripted here. I have just a few notes to my side, so kind of shooting from the hip, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, the movie starred Ricardo Cortez as Sam Spade, uh, B.B. Daniels as the love interest, which, honestly, I just watched all three movies over the past two days. I've seen the 1941 version quite a few times. It's one of my favorite uh, older films, and uh, it's a great 
Bogart film, obviously, as everybody pretty much knows. Uh, so certain details of the story in general are kind of fuzzy in my brain right now because I, I, I just finished the book about four days ago, and I just watched all three movies. So I know the story very well, but I'm trying to piece together in my own mind uh, which aspect goes with which version. Probably would have been a good idea to write that down before uh, trying to do a podcast talking about it. But uh, Ricardo Cortez, B.B. Daniels, uh, one of the things that struck me uh, most about the casting in the 1931 version is the character of Wilmer, who is a kind of hired gun for the main antagonist. He appears in some form or another in all three films, uh, and he actually plays quite a critical role in the... Well, in the in the novel and in the movies during the climactic scene towards the end. Uh, but in the 1931 version, it's actually played by Dwight Fry, who uh, I instantly recognized from the Universal Horror Catalog. He was in Dracula, Frankenstein. Um, he was in a couple other horror movies at the time. What else was he in? I, believe, was he in I think he was in The Invisible Man as well. But anyway... So Dwight Fry, great character actor, uh, filled with manic energy, uh, perfect for the kind of hired gun thug of Wilmer. Uh, the 1931 version was, in my opinion, it was an okay movie. It's it's not a bad movie. It does an excellent job of retaining the story, of allowing the story from the book to kind of flow into a film version. So it does that very well. If, if you're a purist and you like your films to to really follow the book, then this would be a great example because it does it very well. The biggest problem was the casting and the acting kind of falls flat for me. Um, the uh, for Cor- Cort- I'm sorry, Cortez, the main character, the main actor who plays Sam, he does the role well, and he does, but he he, he just doesn't encapsulate the kind of, I guess, the evil side of Sam Spade. Sam is very, uh, I think the book actually describes him at several points as being wolfish, as having the grin of a wolf. So you, you're you cheering for him, but you never know what he's going to do because he could turn on anybody in a second. And you don't get that with Cortez and his portrayal. He's very suave and sophisticated and kind of a ladies' man in the in the book or in the in the film in the nineteen thirty one version. But he just he lacks the edge and he lacks the bite of uh not only the Sam Spade from the novel, but certainly uh Bogart's version. I'm gonna leave out the thirty nineteen thirty six version for a moment. We'll talk about that. But you know, it, it's not a bad film. It's uh it's quite older. Uh I would give it a shot. If you have the um oh by the way the DVD version that I watch, I don't have this on Blu-ray or on DVD. I have the uh, three-disc special edition. It's really great. If you want the Maltese Falcon, it's a great edition to pick up. Uh, it has the Bogart version, uh, quite a few extras, including a great documentary about the film, plus the bonus disc of the other two films. So it's a great way to go. But yeah, the 1931 version, check it out. It's it's an interesting watch. follows the book very well. 1936... Uh, William, oh man, did hear what is his name? It's a German last name. I know it starts with a D. Well, William, he directed a version with Warren William and Betty Davis in one of her early roles. Very famous screen actress of kind of the golden age of Hollywood. And the 1936 version is not called the Maltese Falcon. It's actually called Satan Met a Lady. Uh, the reason being the story. The story of of the 1930 of Satan Met a Lady, it retains the skeleton of the novel. You have the basic premise of a detective, the damsel in distress, the the treasured item that's being sought by, you know, a kind of seedy gangster and everybody else involved. But it completely changes every aspect of the story. You don't have Sam Spade. You have Ted something or another. They actually change the main... Uh, the, the the name of the main character. Uh, it's no longer a falcon. It's no longer a statuette of a falcon, but rather a ram's horn. Um, kind of the shofar from Hebrew. Uh, y- you know, and you have certain characters are changed. Instead of uh, the fall guy, Wilmer, 
you have uh, this very kind of odd British man who is a uh, kind of somewhat hired gun for Gutman. Uh, I think his name was different. Gutman being the main uh, antagonist throughout the story. So not only do you have a lot of characters changed, you have a lot of just kind of situations changed. I don't. Th- I, the film never really says what city it takes place in, I don't think. It's, it's not San Francisco. So you have a lot of elements different, but also the tone. And that's the big thing. The tone is very, very different in St. Metal Lady. It's essentially a comedy. It's kind of a goofball detective gumshoe story, which... Initially, I was kind of, I was really excited about when I had heard that because, you know, I I like these kind of goofball stories. They're always fun, you know, things like Airplane and uh, Top Secret and things like that. But the movie just really falls flat. It did not work. The humor is just odd. It has moments where it is quite funny, usually because of the interactions between the the, uh, main character, the main detective, and and the British man. So those are always some somewhat amusing, but otherwise it's very oddly paced. The humor's kind of odd, and this just isn't you know retrojecting back onto a film from 1936 and and judging it by modern standards. Even at the time, it was pretty widely panned by critics, so it did not work. And I think it's interesting because there's two ways you could look at this. On the one hand. It's a classic example of taking great source material, such as the novel, The Maltese Falcon, and taking a little too much creative license with a film version. So you have this very hard-edged, dark detective story that you turn into a goofy, goofy zane ball kind of comedy, and it just doesn't work because the dark aspect of the novel was so important to that story so that's one way you could look at it it's it's just fails because it failed to it failed to be truthful to the source material i don't think that's necessarily a fair way to look at it though um like i said i enjoyed parts of it overall i didn't like it if i were had if i were to to netflix rate the movie i'd probably say two stars i wouldn't give it one it wasn't absolutely awful uh but it certainly wasn't very good. But the other way you could look at it is it is possible to take source material, a story like that, and turn it into something completely different and actually have it be successful. You can change characters' names. You can change settings and you know the object that's being sought after from a falcon into a horn, and it can still be successful. An example I would point to, and actually what I was thinking about, halfway through the movie, it dawned on me, uh, something similar took place 30 years later, less than 30 years later. That's the movie Dr. Strangelove, uh, Stanley Kubrick's great black comedy. See, there's a great example of taking a film using source material that has one tone and turning it into a movie that has a completely different tone. Uh, if you don't know that, if you are unfamiliar, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Atomic Bomb, one of my favorite comedies of all time, it's this very dark but humorous kind of off-the-wall look at potential nuclear crisis. And the story, and it's one of my favorite film writing stories, while Stanley Kubrick was writing it with his writing partner, uh, Peter George, they were basing it off the movie Failsafe. Uh, no. Red Alert, I'm sorry, Red Alert. Failsafe was another movie. Red Alert by Peter George. See, this is this is why you should script out what you're going to say in a podcast. That way you don't sound like a fool. So the Peter George novel, Red Alert, was the basis that Kubrick and his writing partner, write, writing partner were going to use to make a movie. And it's this very, again, dark, serious look at nuclear warfare at the height of Cold War America. The whole idea that there were systems in place that would inevitably march the United States towards complete nuclear annihilation with Russia. And it was a horrifying thought in this novel. And I, I haven't read this novel. I should put it on my list because I've heard good things. But it essentially pointed out just how horrifying and how close society was to just completely wiping itself out. And 
whole world for that matter. And as Kubrick and his writing partner partner are, are writing the script for this, they start to get a little zany and they start to laugh all the time at just how absurd the whole idea is. Well, f- flash forward a few years when they finish it, or when they go back to it, they decide, why not turn it into a comedy? Because it is so absurd. This whole idea of taking something as serious and as deadly as nuclear war and just making a big joke out of it. And they did it. And they wrote the movie and they filmed it. And it's a great movie. And it's hysterical. It's black comedy. It takes a very serious subject and makes you know, fun of it. But it's still a great adaptation of material and it's a great example of how you can take an artistic license with a source material and turn it into something very creative and actually very original while still paying homage to the original story and for the Maltese Falcon I think that's what the 1936 version tried to do it just failed unfortunately in the humor department but I, I would like to see it I would honestly like to see a version of the Maltese Falcon that could be taken as more of a comedy kind of thing. Which leads me to another point I'll go ahead and just discuss now. As I was thinking about this, since you know you have three different versions of this film over ten years, I was wondering, well, could Hollywood make another Maltese Falcon in this day and age? And the answer is not the way the book is written and not the way the films play out. They are very much products of the time. Uh, Just the dialogue and the situations, it would never work, I don't think, in a modern situation. You could adapt, again, the bare bones story, this kind of quasi treasure hunt and uh, constant backstabbing and who do you trust and who did what, who killed who. Yeah, those elements would transfer just fine. But the heart of the novel, this great dialogue and these great character interactions, it just wouldn't work in a modern setting. And I think maybe part of that's a good thing, so it kind of stays in the past and stays classic and uh, stays something that we can all appreciate. So the 1941 version, uh, you know, what can you say about it? Uh, Humphrey Bogart, it's just a classic. It is the quintessential film noir, as so many people have called it, uh, John Huston directed Humphrey Bogart, Sidney Greenstreet, uh, Mary Astor, Peter Lorre. And it's the perfect matching because it matches a great cast who was mainly unknown at the time. Uh, I believe this was Bogart's first starring role in a film, if not, if not his first, one of his very, very earliest. He had been a character player up to that point, playing mainly gangsters because he's kind of a kind of a hard-edged guy, but this is the first time Warner Brothers took a chance on him and cast him as a lead. Uh, Sidney Greenstreet as Gutman is a fantastic pairing. Uh, to me, he is Gutman because he has just this great evil presence, and all he does is sit. He sits in a chair and talks, and you just get creeped out by the guy, and you get scared by the guy, and all he does is talk. It's amazing. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, go see it. Uh, get it on Netflix. Find it on a streaming service any way you can because uh, it's it's definitely – it's a great introduction to film noir, and it's just a great introduction to movies from the 40s in general. If you primarily watch newer movies, if you're kind of you know the Megaplex moviegoer and the Redbox moviegoer and you want to kind of reach back into film history – yeah, I mean, uh, things like The Wizard of Oz. I think every person, at least in the United States, has seen that movie. Uh, but if you want to go into kind of the black and white film noir era of the 40s, uh, Maltese Falcon is a great place to start. It is one of the quintessential. So, but yeah, Bogart, Peter Lorre, also of a lot of horror movie, uh, a lot of horror movie w- credits on his resume excellent character interactions with them. That one works because Bogart was able to capture the essence of Spade in not only being hard-boiled, being kind of morally ambiguous, but also, and this is a very fine, this kind of a subtle point you had to notice in the film, but they talk a lot, uh, Dashiell talks about it in the book a lot, Sam smiles a lot, and he gives this, like I said earlier, a wolfish grin 
when he may be responding to somebody or telling a story. And the way Bogart does it is the way it's described in the book, in that he, he'll say one thing, but his facial expression will convey something completely different. So you have this kind of this kind of tension, and you know you see this. You know, people do this all the time when you know you're trying to smile while giving somebody bad news, or you know you're trying to smile when and uh, nod your head with somebody who's talking when you know you disagree with them. But Sam does this as a way to again. I think it goes back to being a detective to kind of kind of shielding out the outside world and keeping people away. He's not letting you see his true emotion, but he is it, in a way. He's saying one thing, but his his facial expression says something else. And it's that kind of juxtaposition that gives you uh, this kind of complete portrait of Sam and what he's thinking and how he really feels about a matter. So great acting from Bogart, as always. Uh, my favorite Bogart movie? Uh, maybe. It's, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to top Casablanca. It's just great it's classic it's up there is obviously one of the best movies of all time one of my personal favorites easily um you know uh, treasure of the sierra madre excellent as well so those are the three that i'm most familiar with so but yeah so no I th- it's really great movie check it out um the other two you know like you could skip if you want 1941 is such a classic but if you're interested in the story Check out the other two movies. Definitely read the book. It's a fairly short book. The copy I have, and I just got it from the library. I didn't even buy it. It's 217 pages. It's a pretty short, quick read. So, yeah, so that's it for the Maltese Falcon and From the Desk and Shelf, our first podcast. It was great to do this. Uh, If you listen, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, It's been an interesting little experiment. And, yeah, stay tuned. I'll see you about maybe doing another one. And, like I said, hopefully we'll get a nice condenser mic and a pop filter. Definitely help with the sound quality. I'm going to try to put a little EQ on this before I post it. And take care. Thanks for reading the blog. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you next time.